talking this afternoon, and you came up with a, a, a revealing quote, revealing in its, uh, in, in its directness, as well as its thoroughness. You said it's the, it's the process that creates the imagery, but there are prior notions about what kind of imagery is to be explored. That at once explains uh, how you function as, a, as, a, as an artist, as in, how you function in the studio, and how you function as, as uh, someone trying to communicate with an audience. That, uh, as I said at the beginning of my essay, uh, you distinguish between I, uh, idea, image, and process, but you do not separate them. That they exist on a, not even on a continuity, but they exist simultaneously. You know what you're going to do, you know how you're going to do it, and you know generally what the outcome is going to be. But it's in the myriad questions that exist between those points, uh, the unpredictable things that might happen, the discoveries that the work really exists. Right. Well, I, I mean, I think there's an integration between content, image, process, but it's sort of emerged I mean, let's go back to the start, because I think that's the best way to tell the story. Mm -hmm. I started with the black and white paintings right. that are in the other room, and I sort of knew what kind of imagery. I wanted something that felt explosive and was ambiguous, but felt organic. And I felt that the best way to get to that kind of imagery was to just experiment with paint and see what images paint experimentation would present to me. So I really just started out with oil and water, black and white. I like this idea of a reduced palette and I like this idea of kind of polarities. So you've got black and white, you've got oil and water. And I was trying to make images that felt halfway between some kind of abstraction, but very much hinted at pictorial imagery. Something that could be uh... <coughs> Comprehended as a picture, read as a as, a, as some sort of message, but, a, but an open-ended message, and exist as uh, a set an experiment in in the uh, in the both the creation and the manipulation of form. Right. Well, creation is an interesting word because I think these are sort of like recreations. So they're not pictures that I make, but they're paralleling forces in nature. And my studio is sort of like a laboratory where I try out different things. And my interest is to parallel nature's process, of course, on a quicker time scale, because some of these things take billions of years. And it's sort of like a microcosm of the universe inside my studio. So it's really setting up experiments where organic things are gonna happen and therefore images appear that parallel the processes that made them. So it's kind of this, it's kind of creating a circuit, if you will, or a feedback loop between the input and the output, paralleling natural forces, but directing them at the same time. So it's really a give and take in the studio. I'll start out doing something and an image will appear, and then I can sort of decide to live with that image or push it to the left, push it to the right, so it's a constant, also all these paintings from 1986 to now, they're all done in one shot. So there's no going back and fixing it or changing it. There's a time frame that I have to work within. And so much of the preparation sometimes take days, weeks, even a month. And then I have several hours to basically produce an image. So I'm working within those parameters. Was that true from the first? From the first, though they took longer. The oil and water paintings, what was interesting about them, I would make these huge pours of oil and water. I could leave for an hour, come back, and it was a totally new painting. And then I could decide, do I want that or do I want to steer it another way? So those were really done over long periods of time, 
whereas the newer paintings have to be done quicker because I only have so much time for the paint to dry. At CalArts in 1981, I went to a bar called The Trist. And at The Trist, they would serve these seven layer drinks. So it'd be green, red, orange, pink, blue, yellow. And I remember drinking one and then putting it back on the bar and all the colors were still separate. So that Had they gave me the seed to the idea. <laughs> What's that? <laughs> Had they blended at all? Very little. So I asked the bartender, I said, I mean, it kind of blew my mind. I said, what is going on here? Why? I thought maybe I had too many. <laughs> she said, no, it's different <coughs> viscosities of liquor and different viscosities of crushed ice. So they could keep it to be the heavy ones stay on the bottom and all the way up. So it gave me the clue. I mean, it probably took me 20 years to get from that point to where I was floating these colors on top of each other. But a lot of the work, it has to go through many processes in my mind to get from an idea to the fruition of something. It's never a straight line. 20 years of bartending. Something like that. <laughs> the curves were another 20 years in the making because I had uh, stretched a painting in my studio back in the early 80s and I stretched it too tight on too badly a built stretcher bar and it curved out from the wall. And again, I thought that was a great idea, but it took coming back to LA and really having a reason to make these curved paintings the way they suggested this kind of panoramic space, the curvature of the earth. It, I had to have the subject matter to work with that related to the curvature idea. So a lot of these things, I'll have a clue to something, but it can take many years to get there. So that's why it's always outside information, maybe the accidental curving of the panel, or the drink at the tryst, or anything else. But then I'm also simultaneously just playing with tape in my studio and watching what happens. And based on what happens, it suggests imagery that then I follow that imagery in its particular direction until it feels like it's exhausted. And then another thought that might have come through the process of making all those paintings or it might have come from an external idea. Mm -hmm. Then enters the work and then I explore again. So when I begin any body of work, I'm really working totally in the dark. Well, but you are uh, reacting and proacting at the same time to these, uh, these extraneous uh, uh, ideas and observations. Uh, once, you, once the element of convexity was introduced and, uh, you, or allowed into your practice, the, the idea of concavity presented itself uh, automatically, and you found that, uh, as you told me earlier, uh, that that uh, seemed even more appropriate towards, uh, towards the kind of imagery you were uh, moving towards. In fact, it helped you move towards it. Definitely. Um, I was in New York all, all through the 80s, basically, 82 until 2000, and then I moved back to LA in 2000, and I had a little shop on PCH, and I had my studio in Venice. And I would drive up and down PCH, and I would see what, it's pretty much that view across the room as I went up and down up the coast highway. And I wanted, I sort of continued the work that I was doing in New York in my studio in Venice, but there was so much light pouring in, and I was seeing this imagery of this horizon every day that it just started to make sense to react to that and to explore that. And I began um, just like this center circle painting with one color of pearlescent white paint and just pouring it across the surface and watching what would happen. And as I got to see what would happen, I got to develop it to create this sense of horizontal space or sky meeting ocean, desert meeting sky. But I always wanted it to be very reductive and hint at those things and never become an image of those things. So I think that's constant through the entire show, that there is a certain amount of ambiguity between abstraction and suggesting natural phenomena. Partly a matter of ambiguity, but also a matter of oscillation, of moving from uh, the potential for a red imagery, a, 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 an understood imagery, uh, to a wholly integral uh, 
structure that resists uh, that kind of interpretation. Um, it's not an either or right. situation, it's a both end. Yeah, I mean, hopefully it's a both end. Hopefully that's a richer experience when you have something that is more than one, thing, that appears to be more than one thing and fires your imagination in a way to think of multiple things at once. Mm -hmm. So I really want that room for the viewer to explore when they see the work that not only, I mean, what's interesting that the history of abstraction, I think has given us a really interesting way to look at nature because we've always had amazing things in nature, but it's actually the history of big gestural color field painting that allows you then to see nature kind of in a more abstract way. So you've got this, as you call it, oscillation between looking at something in these two different ways, and I'm really interested in exploring both of those ideas and all the terrain in between. It's interesting you bring up color field painting as something that would lead us to that, uh, because color field painting presents us with uh, a, a way of, of reading and comprehending feel, mm -hmm. atmosphere, and uh, depending on the, on the color relationships, uh, uh, depth. Yeah, so, I mean, a painter like Mark Rothko, who's sort of the ultimate color field painter, just working with bands of color and a pro staining process that gives them these kind of vibrational qualities when you see them. But that's, I guess, what turned me on to the idea of how much you can do with so little in terms of creating something that will act on the viewer and will do something to their mind and to their nervous system that tunes them into a certain way of feeling about something or pictorializing something, both of those things at the same time. Is there anybody else besides Rothko who uh, has a profound an example? I mean, if earlier you've got someone like Turner, and uh, not Bill, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> Joseph Allen <laughs> William. Yes. Also Bill. Also Bill. Um, what was interesting about Turner's work, right, sort of towards the end of his career, he made these paintings that look, were super reduced. I think some of them never even got shown because they assumed they weren't even finished. And they look very much like precursors of Rothko. But I think there's a whole history of that kind of painting going back to Venetian painting that's very much about light and about atmosphere. And it puts you in a certain state of mind when you see it and acts on you. I mean, to me, I want something that when you look at it, you don't stand back and just look at it but it acts upon you, it's, it's active. Does it make sense then to look at this work uh, up close as well as from the from middle distance? I mean, I think all great painting is only great painting if it's interesting from far away and then from a mid-range and then it rewards the viewer when you go closer. So, I mean, hopefully this does that. I feel like when you go, you see the overall composition and the kind of the, the feeling, the atmosphere, what you will, from afar, but when you go close, you see incredible detail. And I found a way through floating these pigments to get detail that's, some of the lines in these paintings, this one here and this one here, are finer than human hair. You would need a, a magnifying glass to really see how fine these lines are. And that's by painstakingly floating a drop of color into a giant bucket one at a time. It would make sense actually to uh, to, to encourage that uh, that multiple uh, viewing position because that that brings forth uh, this condition of oscillation. That, that uh, yeah. some seen up close, it's going to be more abstract than it is from a distance, except when it is. I mean, this is to a lesser effect than something like. Chuck Close's paintings, but obviously you experience that, where when you are far away, you see an image, and when you're close, it breaks <laughs> down. So this isn't to that same kind of extremity, but I think that you do get a different perspective, and you see finer and finer detail. And what I like about that as well is as you see the finer detail, and you see the patterns repeat on small and large scales, 
it sort of it suggests that notion to you that nature has these patterns across all scales. So I think that sort of takes me into this notion of fractals that I've always been interested well, that, in. That's expressed in the, uh, in the uh, time science paintings, the uh, nature working on the macro scale and the mm -hmm. micro scale. Uh, and we, as we were discussing before, you did these at a time in the late 80s, early 90s, when uh, an emerging discourse about uh, uh, chaos theory and uh, leading from that fractals uh, was emerging out of the scientific commu communities and into uh, the more general populace, in in including and especially our artists. Right. Yeah, I mean, there was that moment when chaos theory and fractals kind of burst on the scene in the mid-80s. Mm -hmm. um, but it was a really interesting idea to me because I was already making paintings that were more like the black and white paintings on that side of the wall when I started to read about chaos and fractals. And um, it made me want to explore it more. And I used to read pretty much religiously every Tuesday the, the New York Science Times section which came out. And it was always about the latest discoveries in science. Mm -hmm. And I like that dichotomy right away because you have a newspaper, which is something that's of the moment, it's meant to be discarded at the end of the day, speaking about these time scales of millions of years and this kind of infinite unfolding of uh, matter. There's, and, yeah, there's long been a joke in, in, uh, in the New York art, art scene that, uh, you know, you uh, don't trust an artist who reads the arts and leisure section, or you trust an artist who reads the science section. <laughs> Making these black and white paintings that looked like they could be microscopic, they looked like they could be galactic, and they looked like they could be in the process of forming or in the process of disintegrating. So that was another kind of ambiguity of, that I was exploring. And these Science Times paintings really spent a long time puzzling together each side. So I'd make one image, which was done through a paint reaction, and then on one side, I'd pull a story that was about expansion of the universe on a galactic scale. And on another side, it might be something microscopic about disease or about disintegration. So there was always a micro, there was always a macro, there was always a formation, there was always a deterioration. And I like that notion of a painting that was suspended between all these possibilities. And they gave you a way to read the central image without overly determining. Because still, you have these different ways in, but you could never pin down entirely what you were looking at. There was still an ambiguity or a mercurial quality or an elusiveness to that image and to the framing of how you read that image. So you couldn't, it suggested many things simultaneously, but you never got stuck in only one reading. Well, you almost literalized the framing structure by running the columns uh, on either side of the, uh, of, of the picture. Um, I mean, uh, ultimately, the, 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 column, the left and right columns become, become the picture, or the pillars of the picture, but, they're, but they, begin, they begin as fra framing devices. Right. Uh, and conceptual uh, as well as a struct, as well as formal. Well, I had a very conceptual education. I went to Cal Arts in the early 80s, which was probably the most conceptual art school at that time. I studied with people like Michael Asher, Douglas Hubler, John Balasari, and Barbara Kruger. And so much of the work was text-based work that people were doing. <laughs> And you were told, no matter what, do not paint anything, because painting is <laughs> dead. Right. Uh, well, whenever they say painting is dead, the best painting is being made. I agree. Yeah. So that ignited my interest in painting. And I think the other thing that I, I spoke about once before that ignited my interest in painting is you would see, in, when you went to the art store, there was always these labels that say, do not mix with oil, do not mix with water. So that's, that's going to make you want to do that right away. Maybe. I was going to say, if painting isn't, de if painting isn't dead, you were going to hurt it. Yes. 
So those were two impulses that drove me towards painting, but once I developed a body of work through this oil and water paint reaction, I did want to revisit these notions of text as a way of, again, taking kind of two polarities, if you will, and smashing them together and seeing what the resulting thing. And I think that's a huge part of my interest in my investigation for the last 35 years is taking these oppositional forces, forcing them together, and then getting a result or reaction from that. So the science times paintings were very, a very deliberate attempt to con have abstract painting confront text, but to do it in a way that they were fighting and yet there was an integration. So there was this push-pull between these two things. That's interesting you, you uh, describe your work as driven by this, uh, uh, by this oppositional dynamic, uh, this dialectic mm -hmm. uh, Because we, uh, as we were talking this afternoon about uh, the newest work, uh, this, with this looming boulder-like figure, uh, juxtaposed against a, fi uh, a, a, a field, it's uh, it's practiced one way uh, in this painting over here, where the field is is uh, is a, gr a gradation of of uh, one color or color range, uh, and the uh, and the if you would marbleized uh, uh, figure stands out from it in the front, which is a color field uh, approach, uh, or even a Hans Hoffman approach, whereas that. Uh, figure against the ground. The ground and the figure uh, consist of the same material, if you would, uh, so, uh, so that the figure distinguishes itself against the ground not by an uh, a complete opposition of, of image and structure uh, or concept, but by an upheaval in a single field of material, if you would, uh, that can be read as much as continu continuity as context. This is probably the newest, well, it's the newest direction in the, in the show. The painting behind us is actually the newest painting in the show. But I feel like this painting that's called Geomore 1504 over there, uh, it was done in December. It was done specifically for this show and it really came out of looking at this painting right here and this painting over here and wanting to find a way to again sort of smash them against each other, pit them against each other, but yet get integration. And what was interesting, as soon as I made it, so this painting was made, all of these paintings in this room are made with paint that's floated and then dispersed across the surface and then manipulate it flat. So I, to make a painting like that, it's one entire painting finished and then I let it dry for a couple weeks and then come in with a whole second pour over the top which forms this kind of boulder shape. And what was interesting about it is, yeah, there's a figure ground relationship, but there's a real tug of war for hierarchy as well. So that the, the ground at one point dominates and another sort of figure in the boulder will, it, it's a real back and forth because they're done with the exact same color palette and they're applied pretty much in a, the exact same way. So you have two things on top of each other fighting for primacy, if you will. Also the illusory, the illusion of motion is much more uh, pronounced there than it is there. The, uh, and, uh, and a certain amount of motion, of flow, of flow if you will, uh, is uh, is a uh, has become a necessary element in your work. That the, the, the work, no, no, the image a, of the work. It's not a necessary element, but it's a pursuit. So I feel one of the big pursuits, other than this idea of bringing these polarities against each other, getting these reactions, is to make work that feels like it's in motion. So you have. I mean, you're limited by painting, it's a static object. Mm -hmm. So for, to, to me, the biggest challenge as a painter is to make something static, not feel static. So motion has been my quest for, since the show, 
35 years at least. Mm -hmm. This idea that you're making something static, but it feels like it's moving. And all, I guess the other big quest is you've got something that light is reflecting off of, but I've always wanted to make it feel like the light is emanating out. So you have this motion and you have this emanation of light and hopefully light in motion. And to me, so many great painters from this century and going back as far as Titian, that's the pursuit to create light, energetic fields that feel like they're in motion. And yet when you light the reproductions of, uh, of paintings from behind, as, as you would looking at them on, on a computer screen, uh, they die. It's, uh, they have to, a, a painting has to produce its own light in, in that way. Right. Well, they become the something else. Yeah. Certainly. And, um, yeah, I mean, these paintings actually have pearlescent pigment integrated in them. So it's very active. As you walk around, the light on the surface is not static. Mm -hmm. It sort of percolates as you walk left and right, back and forth. When did you start using that material? Uh, 1990. So one of the last New York Science Times paintings I did was fuchsia and gold, and it was about this alchemical quest for gold, or for transforming lead into gold, and that's the first time I started using the iridescent and pearlescent paints. Is that also one of the first times you were referenced alchemy? It was definitely the first time I referenced alchemy directly. Um, I think I first read about alchemy in a book called Under the Volcano by Malcolm Lowry that I read while I was at CalArts. And it just alluded to it, and it always piqued my interest. So I started all through the 80s, I read more and more, and I feel a real connection with alchemy. Um, for you that, for those of you that don't know, alchemy really preceded chemistry and physics as we know it. And it began possibly in ancient Egypt, it's unclear but it probably became the most prominent in the late 1500s, early 1600s. And Newton actually wrote way more about alchemy than he ever did about physics. And he was frustrated because he was never able to transform base metals into gold, even though he discovered gravity. Natural sciences are a direct offshoot of alchemy. The thing about alchemy was much more integrated. It was a search for material transmutation but it was also a search for some kind of spiritual elevation or spiritual enlightenment, if you will. They didn't believe that you would be able to transform lead into gold unless you had elevated your own personal frequency, let's say. So you had to be an initiate and you had to study this for a long time. And you, I feel, I've always felt like the artistic process very much parallels this notion of alchemy, that you make these things and that hopefully you, there's discoveries along the way and you sort of up your frequency, if you will, and hopefully for the viewer as well. It sounds like you came to, came, you accepted alchemy into your uh, working process, uh, not just your work, around the same time that you uh, embraced the concept, of, the fractal concept. Yeah, I mean, I don't know that they've ever been discussed side by side, but I've always thought about alchemy and fractals pretty much in the same wheelhouse, if you will. Because the idea of a fractal, it's a pattern that repeats across scales. So if you have something very, if you look under a microscope, you might see a, a patterning. And then if you pull back from that same view, say, of the Earth, that patterning will, will repeat on the next scale, on the next scale, on the next scale. Mm -hmm. And the alchemical notion was, what is above, so is below. So mm -hmm. there's a connection between human endeavor and the cosmos. Mm -hmm. There's this co connection across all scales. So for me, fractals and alchemy, even though fractals as we know it, came about in, I guess, the 1980s, maybe the 1970s, and alchemy goes way back. I feel like there's a real connection between those disciplines. The horizontal curves came about from moving back to LA in the early 2000s and seeing light, and also very much about, I saw 2001 A Space Odyssey when I was six years old at the Cinerama Dome. My parents took me, and uh, 
it was a moment that moved that to this day resonates because you have this space coming around you and then the final sequence you're moving at light speed through this kind of landscape this kind of abstracted landscape where you see colors below and colors above and it's this infinite space and that idea of infinity and of just oscillating colors suggesting the infinite it just sort of stuck with me so i feel <coughs> that these paintings were an homage to that, that Cinerama notion and, and the curvature of the earth and the curvature of the horizon. And then I really wanted to start pushing that notion of curve further. So I started these vertical curve paintings in 2014. And what I like about them is they curve this way. So every different angle the light is hitting them, you're getting different kind of highlights. So you're getting a much brighter kind of emanation of light from the bottom, and then it sort of fades into shadow. But it also is very suggestive of a wave or other natural forms. And I started doing them with just flat sides, and then I realized I wanted them to float, and that caused the sides to cut in at a 45 and create these kind of parabolic shapes. So this direction of these vertical curves along with these metamorph or geomorph forms, as I call them, are pretty much the newest directions in my work. So uh, you're emphasizing that the vertical curves uh, work, uh, uh, utilize the same process, process uh, uh, premises to, uh, to uh, create different, uh, different conditions, uh, optical conditions than the uh, horizontal. They do. They do. And uh, I'm fascinated by the fact that uh, all of this is uh, related to your, your experience as a, as a kid with this uh, the dive through Jupiter's atmosphere um, because that was an inf that was a matter of infinite depth right and uh, that uh, losing and then finding and then losing again and then finding uh, the uh, the horizon line it, uh, it goes in and out of right. obscurity. But I feel like painting like this, you really get that sensation that there's a horizon line and then there's another horizon line. It's, you can't quite pin down where one element stops and another starts. And I've always liked that type of ambiguous space that feels infinite and where you can't tell one thing apart from another. But I think where this is done in 2011 and this is the most recent painting in the show. And I think the difference is, now I'm trying to get to a more complex type of space. It isn't defined specifically by one horizon, but by multiple possible horizons, by multiple possible vantage points. Mm -hmm. So it's more abstract and it's more psychedelic, if you will. Mm -hmm. Space is being squeezed and pressed in many different ways but it's a kind of holistic feeling of space. But again, this also goes back to your experience of living out by the ocean, where on, on a day like today, for instance, the, uh, uh, the, the clouds could create a, their own horizon above the horizon line of uh, where sea and sky meet. And then there's a third horizon created where, where the beach ends. Right. I think in the far north in Denmark, I once saw five different points that felt like their horizon simultaneously. So. That, and that's where Walt Disney used to go to get inspiration in the summertime. Because the sunsets last about five hours there. So you've got this light shifting and changing and these multiple horizons. So I even kind of refer to the space in this painting as Fantasia kind of space. Because it's, it's not clear cut. It's abstracted, it's psychedelic, it's multi-dimensional. Mm -hmm.